So welcome to the Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Summit's Day 2 Second Session. I want to thank all of those that have joined us from the prior summit sessions and welcome new folks that have joined today's exciting discussion. My name is Christy Kehoe and I'm the Mid-Atlantic Regional Coordinator with the NOAA Marine Debris Program. I'm excited to speak to you today about tackling derelict fishing gear. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart and one of the issues we address at the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Now, a few technical reminders. Please keep your Zoom on mute until the panel session so that we don't have any disruptions. Although your cameras will be turned off for attendees, we encourage you to stay on as we'll have polls and other engagement tools during the event. We'll also be recording the summit and it'll be available later on the MARCO website. As a reminder, the goal of this week's summit is to inspire and empower our partners in the marine debris reduction. We will be hearing updates on current marine debris science and trends and we'll explore techniques and tools that are effective in enhancing knowledge, changing behavior, and influencing policies that reduce marine debris. We are excited to be working with all of you, our Mid-Atlantic partners, as we explore regional efforts to reduce sources on marine debris impacts. And for the rest of today's summit, we'll be discussing tackling derelict fishing gear. I'll give a 10-minute high-level introductory review about the topic, and then we'll hear from our expert speakers from across the region ending with a Q&A panel. We encourage all of you to participate in our polls today and the Q&A session feature at the bottom of your screen. Please do not use the chat box. Also, as a reminder, if you have questions that are for a specific speaker, please make note of which speaker you're referring to in the Q&A box. Now with that, uh, now that we're done with webinar logistics, let's change gears to focus on today's session topic, tackling derelict, derelict fishing gear. All right, next slide. So to start us off, we're going to bring up a Zoom poll to learn a little bit more about how this issue impacts you all. The question is, what type of derelict fishing gear is most common in your home waters with options for lines, traps or pots, netting and trawls, other fishing gear items, or I have no idea. So we're gonna bring up that poll now and give you a few seconds to respond. I will ask for the derelict fishing gear speakers if you don't mind putting yourself off camera right now until I queue you up. All right, so while those responses are coming in, I wanna highlight that the Marine Debris Program has resources for derelict fishing gear issues that could be found on our website. All right, so how are we looking on those results? Okay, we have a few of I have no ideas. Uh, predominantly traps or pots for the region, some lines, and then netting and trawls a little bit behind with other fishing gear items and the last. All right, so we can put that away. Um, so now I'll spend the next few slides providing a high level overview of derelict fishing gear issue and today's agenda. Next slide, please. So the Mid-Atlantic region is home to a variety of species of marine life, including American lobster, blue crabs, squids, eastern oysters, black sea bass, Atlantic croaker, just to name a few. Fishing still defines the Mid-Atlantic culture today, filling our menus and attracting, attracting tourists from all over the world. Many fishermen still fish in the same places and for the same species that their ancestors did years ago. Recreational fishing is also a popular pastime for residents and tourists alike. Commercial fisheries and aquaculture contribute billions to the Mid-Atlantic region's economy, and fishing continues to be an economic and cultural mainstay for many Mid-Atlantic communities. Next slide, please. Unfortunately, derelict fishing gear is an unintended consequence of these activities. Modern fishing gear is generally made of synthetic materials, metals, or even wood that can persist in the environment for a really long time. Lost, abandoned, or otherwise discarded fishing gear also called derelict fishing gear, harms both the fishing industry, the environment, habitat, and wildlife. Next slide, please. So there are many factors that cause fishing gear to be abandoned, lost, or otherwise discarded. This includes adverse weather, aging gear in poor conditions, interactions with vessels, accidental disposal, access or lack of access to a disposal collection facilities, and many more. Next slide, please. So common items of derelict fishing gear include monofilament, fluorocarbon, braided wire or long lines. Next. 
as well as traps or pots for lobsters or crabs or other species, which we indicated on our poll that was one of the top items we see in our home waters here. Next slide. This can also include netting and trawls. Next. And buoys, ropes, sinkers, and other fishing items. Next slide, please. These could continue to impact, uh, lead to impacts such as ghost fishing, which occurs when lost or discarded fishing gear is no longer under someone's control and continues to trap and kill both target and known target species. We'll hear more in just a little bit about ghost fishing in our next presentation. Next slide. Derelict fishing gear can also negatively impact communities and fisheries. This includes the cost of repairing or replacing lost gear and decreased populations of target species. Next slide. Derelict fishing gear can also damage underwater habitats like coral reefs and seagrass beds as it continues to rest or travel on the seafloor. And this can also hinder the safe navigation of vessels. Next slide. Thankfully, there are many organizations working hard to address the derelict fishing gear and identifying solutions. Some of these solutions include working closely with commercial, recreational, fishing and boating communities, removing lost or end of life gear, promoting prevention and circular economy approaches, advancing innovative technologies and identifying disposal collection sites. There are many solutions taking place to address the issue, which brings me to our discussion today. Next slide. Today, we'll be hearing from four speakers who will each provide roughly 15 minute presentation. We'll hear from Global Ghost Gear Initiative and Ocean Conservancy's program manager, Jacqueline McGarry, to discuss her programmatic, her program's holistic approach to addressing the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. Then Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center senior scientist, Dr. Susan Barco, will discuss debris ingested by stranded marine mammals and turtles in Virginia. Third, we will hear from the University of Delaware and Delaware Sea Grants Coastal Ecology Specialist, Kate Fleming, who will highlight removal efforts in Delaware using innovative technology. And our fourth speaker is Net Your Problems Business and Project Development Coordinator, Sarah Aubrey, who will share circular economies approach and pathways to recycle end of life fishing gear. We'll then have a 30 minute panel or so discussion on questions pulled from attendees summit registration forms, as well as, well as those provided in the Q&A feature. Now for our first guest speaker in the session, I would like to welcome Jacqueline McGarry. Uh, so Jacqueline, if you wanna uh, turn on your camera, please feel free to do so as I introduce yourself. So Jackie serves as the program manager for Ocean Conservancy's Global Ghost Gear Initiative or Triple GI, a cross-sectoral and stakeholder alliance of fishing gear, industry, private sector, corporate, nonprofit, academic and governmental organizations focused on solving the problems of lost and abandoned fishing gear worldwide. She coordinates between Triple GI leadership and projects around the globe. Prior to her role with Triple GI, Jackie worked at the Capitol Hill Ocean, Ocean Week manager for the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation and as a member of Ocean Conservancy's digital communications team, helping ocean champions find their voices as storyteller. Jackie earned a master's in coastal environmental management from Duke University's Nicholas School of the Environment and a certificate in community-based environmental management. She is based in Ocean Conservancy's office in Washington, DC. With that being said, take it away, Jackie. Hi, Christy. Thank you so much uh, to you and to everyone else for having me. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pull up my slides uh, this afternoon. Make sure that you can see this. Um, hopefully everybody can see those slides. Um, so thank you again. My name is Jackie McGarry. And as Christy said, I am the manager for the Global Ghost Gear Initiative at Ocean Conservancy. Christy just gave a great overview of what ghost gear is. Um, but just briefly, I wanted to touch on uh, a few points. Ghost gear is the most common name for abandoned, lost, or discarded fishing gear. You may also hear me call this uh, ALDFG during today's presentation. And since ALDFG is designed to capture marine life, it is the most harmful form of marine debris. Most of it is made out of modern plastics that can persist in the environment for more than 600 years. And so it will continue to capture and kill wildlife as well as uh, harm, harm the marine environment throughout its lifespan. 
we know that ghost gear is caused by a number of both indirect and direct causes. So some direct causes might be things like adverse weather, a big storm that you know will unexpectedly blow a pot or trap out of the area where a fisher has set it, um, spatial pressures. So you know with lots and lots of uh, vessel traffic and things like that, you might accidentally run over a, a, some set gear and cut that line by mistake. Um, improper fishing methods or gear that's not been properly maintained. Um, and then we also know that gear loss is often unintentional. For fishers, their gear is their livelihood. And so in most cases, we don't see intentional discard. And so these instances are often linked to IUU fishing or in some cases, inaccessible or expensive facilities. This is truly a gro uh, global problem and we see uh, ALDFG all over the world. Uh, an estimate by the UN Environment Program and Food and Agriculture Organization found that at least 640,000 metric tons of fishing gear is lost or discarded in our ocean each year. Um, we believe that this figure is actually much, much higher as it's based on some pretty outdated studies, but it's kind of our best global figure uh, at the moment. It's uh, also known from recent studies that about 46 to 70% of the floating macroplastic in our ocean is made of, of ghost gear when measured by weight. And depending on where in the world you're talking about and which fishery, between five and 30% of global harvestable fish stocks uh, are killed by ghost gear each year. And so ghost gear is truly a multifaceted problem affecting you know, everything from global food security to coastal communities and fisher livelihoods. Uh, in 2016, Ocean Conservancy and CSIRO performed a threat rank analysis of the ocean's deadliest trash. Um, you'll see that fishing gear is at the top of this list. And so despite the fact that we often hear about um, plastic bags or bottles and things, which are all you know, really important to address as well, fishing gear continues to have the highest impact on wildlife. Which leads us to what is the Global Ghost Gear Initiative. So the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is the only cross-sectoral alliance committed to driving solutions to the problem of lost and abandoned fishing gear worldwide. We work to improve the health of the marine ecosystem, protect marine life from harm, and safeguard human health and livelihoods. We do this through our three R's, so reduce, uh, remove, and recycle. We work to reduce the amount of gear that is lost in the oceans, remove the gear that is already there, and recycle the gear that we recover through or at the end of its life through extended producer responsibility. We truly are a global organization uh, with 124 members. We also have 18 supporting governments. Most recently, the United States and Mexico joined in at the end of 2020, and Iceland joined uh, earlier this year. Uh, in addition to our four high-level global affiliates, you'll see that we have active projects around the world. Um, those are the little yellow dots on your screen. Um, and those, you know, like I said, are our on-the-ground projects, whether past or present. And the green dots are our uh, global best practice workshops. We've co-hosted a number of these with UNFAO um, in, the, in the before times, but to help share knowledge for best practices for managing lost and abandoned fishing gear. Uh, and we've continued to engage globally through virtual platforms. Uh, these workshops always include stakeholders from across the seafood supply chain. So governments, fishers, fishery managers, and NGOs all together at the table. That model really rep is represented in the Triple GI membership. Uh, with such a, a multifaceted problem, we try to give all of the different uh, partners and stakeholders kind of a voice in, in finding a solution. So you'll see that our members, many of whom you may recognize, uh, span the fisheries sector, industry, retail, academia, nonprofits, and government. Our approach to ghost gear is kind of best captured in three main pillars. Um, they are build evidence, define best practice and in, uh, define best practice and inform policy and catalyze and replicate solutions. Um, and in addition to the work that Triple GI's leadership team at Ocean Conservancy does, we also have member working groups working on each of these, these topics. Um, so build evidence is really about supporting research on ALDFG to better understand the breadth of this problem and which in interventions are the most impactful. 
Define best practice and inform policy uh, works with our, both our governments and our corporates to think about the systems that they have for prevention and mitigation of ghost gear through uh, action plans. And finally, by catalyzing and replicating solutions, we're creating scalable projects on the ground that where we can test you know, new technologies or demonstrate proof of concept for new collection and recycling schemes and working with local experts to remove ghost gear from the environment. Under that uh, build evidence kind of pillar, one of our major tools is the Ghost Gear Data Portal. It is the world's largest collection of Ghost Gear data. Uh, and we recently launched what we affectionately call Data Portal 2.0. Uh, and we're currently working with our members to transfer and update their data. Uh, it can accommodate you know, bulk uploads from uh, through customized dashboards, which will display all of an organization's data separate from the global aggregate. So um, if one of our members comes to us and says, hey, we'd really like to start implementing some reporting and tracking schemes, and we don't have a place to store this data, or we don't know where to do it, we've got some tools ready to go for them so that they can start doing that. And in tracking through their own organization, they are contributing to our understanding of this problem around the world. Additionally, we're working to develop some uh, kind of query and reporting and visualization tools in the coming months and looking forward to rolling those out. The data portal is supported by the Ghost Gear Reporter app, um, which you can download on your, your iPhone or your Android. Um, and much like many other marine debris apps, you can use it to log when you see, if you're out on the water and you see Ghost Gear, um, and you also have the option to retrieve uh, to mark which gear is retrieved. Um, apologies for what is a busy slide, but um, uh, the, I wanted to take a moment, of course, to talk about what we kind of, you know, is our Triple GI Bible, which is our best practice framework for the management of fishing gear. Uh, it was de first developed in 2017, and it's a comprehensive guidance document um, across all of the major actors of the seafood supply chain. So 10 different stakeholder groups, you know, everyone from fisheries regulators and gear manufacturers, NGOs to fishers themselves. Um, and we actually also just launched an updated version of this uh, as well earlier this month. Um, the guidance provided in the document is based on a threat analysis, which you see on the left here. Um, and that threat analysis looks at both the likelihood of loss as well as the impact of specific gear types to kind of come up with targeted strategies for prevention, mitigation, and removal. So the document will break down by stakeholder type. What are the prevention strategies for a, a fisher? What are the mitigation strategies? And what are the uh, removal strategies? And then it'll do the same thing for our corporates, for our NGOs, and for our, our government members. Some examples of prevention strategies might be things like marking fishing gear uh, and or its major components, um, or the creation of port reception facilities to properly dispose of end of life gear before it enters the environment. Mitigation strategies are things like um, having reporting schemes when or systems in place. So if you lose gear, you can mention that it was lost and say where and what type so that if it's recovered, it can be returned to you. And then obviously removal strategies are things like identifying gear hotspots or noting which uh, under, you know, pots, nets, ropes, what, whatever they are, pose the most significant navigation hazard or economic loss by ghost fishing. This best practice framework has been adapted into a number of tools. So first and foremost on the left, you'll see a photo from one of our, our workshops. Uh, this one was held in Panama, where we bring all of those different stakeholder groups into the room to work together to build a ghost gear action plan for a region. Um, we have also uh, adapted the best practice framework uh, into a, uh, an introductory or companion guide for our corporate members and help them to think about uh, how to start tracking this across their supply chains. Um, that I've already mentioned the data portal and the Ghost Gear Reporter app. And then finally, um, the original best practice framework addresses uh, wild capture fisheries, but we are anticipating very, very soon launching a uh, aquaculture version. So please stay tuned for that because that is that is coming soon. Um, and then finally, that third pillar of the Global Ghost Gear Initiative is to catalyze and replicate solutions. Uh, we work to identify strategies that can be replicated and scaled depending on geography or fishery. 
And these projects are always developed in collaboration with our local partners. Um, we work to incorporate their experience and knowledge of the conditions on the ground, and then pair that knowledge with you know, either innovative technology trials or lessons learned from other solutions projects to create solutions that are you know, viable, lasting, and really make sense for those that are involved. And of course, any of the projects that we support need to meet the needs of those community because there's no silver bullet for ghost gear. Currently, we have ongoing work in Nigeria, Canada, Indonesia, United States, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Vanuatu. And so in my last kind of couple of minutes, I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of those US projects. Um, the first is our project in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, this project is supported by NOAA Marine Debris and 11th Hour Racing. We are also working our, with our on-the-ground partner, the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation. Back in 2019, we did a ghost gear retrieval with them, and it actually yielded a 10-ton gear ball, which is our single largest gear retrieval to date. Um, I It was before I joined the Triple GI team, but I hear all of the time about how that was just like the most impressive feat that, that a lot of my teammates have seen. Um, and so we're currently in the first year of a three-year project with them where we're doing a series of gear retrievals, uh, fisher workshops, and um, also gear collection drives, both in the Gulf of Maine and in Canada. And the end of the project will culminate in a cross-border summit between fishers who participated in those workshops and have some kind of cross-border learning and knowledge transfer. And then finally is a very exciting uh, project. It's brand new for us and we're just getting off the ground now with some of our kind of first funders coming in the door, but this is our North American Net Collection Incentive Initiative or NANCY. It's a partnership between the Triple GI, Boreo, uh, which is a B certified B Corporation uh, that recycles fishing gear and turns it into new, pro uh, new products, as well as the Mexican government and several local partners in Mexico to collect and recycle fishing gear from the west coast of Mexico and the United States. Um, through this project, we'll be conducting a series of fisher surveys to understand where gear is being lost and the major causes of it. Um, and that will inform a series of capacity building workshops with both fishers and government stakeholders. Uh, and through that, we'll come up with a national ghost gear action plan, um, as well as build on some of the work we've been doing in the US and combining those action plans. This is the first uh, large scale transboundary effort across North America uh, and it includes partners in the US, Canada, and Mexico coming together to tackle lost and abandoned fishing gear. That about wraps up what I have for today, but I wanted to thank everyone again for having me and I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank, thank you, Jackie. That was really great, really informative. Um, it was great to hear about those global efforts and the visual of a 10 ton gear ball will stay in my mind uh, for the rest of the afternoon and probably for a while. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Senior Scientist of the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center, Dr. Susan Barco. Sue, would, if you want, you can turn on your camera now as I read your bio. Uh, Dr. Susan Barco has worked off and on with the Virginia Aquarium and Marine Science Center in a variety of capacities since 1986. She received a BS in biology at the College, College of William and Mary in 1986, an MS in biology at James Madison University in 1995, and a PhD in marine biology from UNC Wilmington in 2018. Sue's master's research focused on bottlenose dolphin abundance and distribution in Virginia, and her dissertation focused on the conservation and ecology of loggerhead sea turtles in the Chesapeake Bay. Most of her career has been spent working with protected marine species in the mid-Atlantic with a particular focus on interactions between animals, fishing gears, and vessels. With that, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Sue. Um, and if you want, feel free to uh, share your screen. Okay. Can you see my screen? There we go, looks great. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna to talk to you today about marine debris found in and on stranded marine mammals and sea turtles in Virginia. Uh, the Virginia Aquarium, um, let's see, I don't seem to be able to, oh, here we go. Uh, this, the um, 
image on the front was sent to us by one of our cooperators at the Eastern Shore National Wildlife Refuge. And the small white string you see is a ribbon from a balloon that we presume this turtle ingested and uh, it's coming out the oral cavity. So obviously it's pretty decomposed so we couldn't definitively tell what caused the death of the turtle but that looks fairly suspicious to me. The Virginia Aquarium Stranding Response Program covers marine mammal and sea turtle strandings for the state of Virginia. We define a stranded animal as an animal that is, that is sick, injured, dead, entangled, or out of habitat. Most of the animals we respond to are dead. Uh, we get around 100 marine mammals a year. These are whales, dolphins, porpoises, seals. Um, I would say about 75% are bottlenose dolphins of all life stages. We see between 250 and 300 sea turtles per year. About 65% of those are loggerhead sea turtles. Another 20 to 25% are Kemp's Ridley sea turtles, which are the most uh, endangered species of sea turtle. We see debris interactions, um, mostly ingestion and entanglement. And I kind of divided ingestion into accidental, where we think the animal uh, actually mistakes the debris for a food item and intentionally feeds on the debris or ingests the debris versus incidental where in going after natural prey, the accidentally or incidentally ingests debris that is in the area. Um, we see entanglement in uh, gear. Some of it is ghost gear, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Also trash and toys. Uh, here's an example here of a, of a pretty decomposed Kemp's Ridley turtle in a woven Tyvek bag. I believe these bags are used uh, quite a bit on the Eastern shore in the shellfish aquaculture business, uh, but I'm sure there are other uses as well. But this is sort of, while it is not specifically gear that is put in the water, it is, I believe, gear associated with uh, commercial fishing. Uh, and then uh, next to that are a couple of pieces of uh, debris that were pulled from the, the GI tract of a sea turtle, one being a shredded latex. As well as a few other types of plastic. So ingestion with animals, we see uh, that they feed on hard plastics, styrofoam, flexible plastics like film bags and uh, balloons, as well as line, rope, string, and ribbon. And what you're seeing on the slide right here is the some of the uh, anthropogenic GI contents from a single green turtle that included a number of pieces of what looked like balloon, some string, some flexible clear plastic, rigid plastic, and, and other things. When we looked a little bit at the incidents, uh, we did a, a, a study of our sea turtle strandings. We found 27 cases from 2009 to 2014. And by species, we found the incidence of debris in the GI system uh, anywhere between less than 1% and nearly 31%, depending on the species. Um, this is a gross underestimate because not all of the strandings were examined for uh, their GI contents at all and specifically for, for debris in their GIs. Um, but, but you can see it ranged from something like this long balloon string, which actually caused torsion of the intestines in this loggerhead turtle to an incidental, most likely an incidental ingestion of this piece right here, along with spider crab parts in a Kemp's Ridley turtle. Here's some other examples of debris found uh, in a sea turtle, a pygmy sperm whale and a harbor porpoise. however, of a live turtle or a live animal that we think the stranding was caused by the debris ingestion. This is a green sea turtle that stranded in the fall of, of 2008, very thin. Um, it had a distended esophagus and a lot of both food items and debris wedged in the sphincter between the esophagus and the stomach. Through a series of endoscopic uh, procedures, we were able to pull that debris out. And this is just the, the bit of anthropogenic debris from one of those sessions. This turtle did survive and fattened up quite a bit before we released it uh, almost a year later. Uh, we also see ingestion in marine mammals. This is the case of a, of a say whale that was swimming in August of, I believe, 2014. We tracked it for a few days before it eventually died. This is an open ocean pelagic whale. It should not have been in the river, so we knew there was something wrong. 
And upon examination, we found this piece of rigid plastic in the main stomach of the animal. We realized it was actually a part of a DVD case. So here's a DVD case here, and here's the piece of plastic. It had some very sharp points on it, had caused some really nasty ulcerative lesions in the main stomach, and it was too large for the animal to, um, to pass through the rest of the GI system. This piece of plastic floated, and we believe because this is a baleen whale that engulfs large, uh, large bodies of prey, that it most likely would have actually ingested this as it. Sue, I don't mean to jump in, but we are seeing you freeze every now and then. So I might suggest, if you don't mind, just turning off your camera um, and continuing the presentation, if that's okay with you. Sorry that about that. Mine. Thank you. Okay, um, let's continue here. Um, although not in Virginia, we've seen uh, uh, sperm whales in a number of cases along the Atlantic coast ingest debris. And uh, this is just the example of the GI contents from one animal from the North Carolina Outer Banks. And you can see the, the size and the number of pieces of debris here. This is a, a, a 10 by 10 tarp and it, it, it ingested in complete rolls of plastic as well as individual plastic bags, line and, and other things. Um, entanglement uh, does occur. Here's another case of one of these Tyvek bags. Uh, it was removed from this turtle by a citizen who found it floating off the Eastern shore of Virginia. At the time, the flipper where it was entangled had actually uh, already started to get necrotic and we had to do an amputation. The turtle was released later. Uh, but again, we see these, these woven uh, Tyvek bags that, that actually turn into this sort of nest of plastic. This is the actual bag that was removed from the animal. Um, so we see that type of packaging, we see rigid plastics, uh, and then of course, uh, other types of line, twine, string, Bottlenose dolphin still dependent on its mom. We assume this is the mother here. This is an aerobi frisbee around its neck. You can see it's already cut into the animal's head. Uh, it was moving back and forth, but as this is a young animal, uh, if the frisbee stayed on the animal, it would have eventually caused some pretty severe lesions. A capture attempt was made after observing the animal for about two weeks. Uh, the first capture was not successful and the animal then disappeared. The mom was seen two months later without the calf. Um, again, not yet in Virginia, but certainly probably coming our way as our seal population increases. Uh, our seals like to stick their heads in things. So this is a gray seal with another aerobi frisbee cutting an elephant seal from the west coast with a packing band deeply embedded in its neck and a California sea lion also with debris around its neck. Uh, so anything, any loop of line or twine, uh, anything that's around a, a marine mammal will find a way to stick its head inside. When we talk about gear, it's certainly difficult many times to determine whether fishing gear was being actively fished or whether it was derelict at the time that the animal became entangled in it. But I would like to pose that another actual cause of derelict gear are animals becoming entangled in the gear and moving it around. So here's an example of uh, a, a sea turtle. Most likely it became entangled in recreational hook and line swam away uh, and the, um, the, 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 the fisherman probably didn't know to cut the gear, couldn't recover the animal. We get reports nearly weekly of turtles breaking lines at fishing piers. Uh, and so there are a lot of turtles out there that are swimming away with quite a bit of gear on them. If they manage to shed that gear, that gear is then derelict gear. This is a loggerhead sea turtle with what we thought was a crab pot. When we recovered the animal, we found it was a whelk pot, but the whelk pot was actually in a place where whelk pots weren't at the time being set. Most likely this animal either physically moved the gear while it was still alive or it died and as the carcass bloated, it moved the gear. And just this year we had a, a fairly large bottlenose dolphin become entangled in one or two crab pots and then those crab pots, as the animal moved around, hooked onto six or more additional crab pots, all of which were found in the middle of the bay in an area where crab potting, potting is illegal and no pots were known to be. So particularly relatively lightweight gear 
gets moved around by animals. And those animals sometimes shed the gear, sometimes they die and they decompose, and then the gear is derelict because of their interactions. So that's something to think about. Um, not only is commercial gear involved, this, these are all, this is a mass of recreational fishing line, twine, lures, uh, sinkers, and rods mixed up with some bryozoans. It was found a couple of hundred feet from a fishing pier. This is a green sea turtle that got entangled in that gear. It did not actually bite onto a hook, which we often see. It was entangled in the gear. When we tried to sort through this, this was just part of the mass. The mass actually broke as we were trying to recover it. It was less than half of the mass that we that we think was down there. Uh, these are the hooks, three different fishing pieces of fishing rods, and over a hundred sinkers that weighed more than 40 pounds just in this mass alone. There are a couple of other emerging concerns that we have uh, with animals and debris. One is weather balloons. Um, there are approximately 900 locations Sue, are you able to hear us? Hey, Sue, we lost you there for a quick second. Would you mind just starting this slide over again for us? Sure. Can you hear me now? Yes. All right. Uh, these are our uh, weather balloon entanglements. Uh, weather balloons are released from about 900 locations worldwide, one or more per day. Several of them are often released in Virginia. Uh, this is uh, one from 2009 and one from 2019. Both appear to have entangled and killed Kemp's Ridley sea turtles. Um, the most recent one was released from NASA Langley. It flew for about two hours. Ten days later, entangled in the debris from the balloon. The balloons are, uh, the entire apparatus is about 70 feet. There's about 70 feet of line between the balloon and the instrument, which is right here. Um, after 2009, the Weather Service told us they changed from nylon twine to cotton twine, uh, but cotton twine still takes months to break down and this turtle was entangled and killed days after this was released. Um, we're also concerned about uh, micro braided fishing twine. This is high performance fishing twine meant for hook and rod, hook and line fishing. Uh, this is a bottlenose dolphin that was observed alive with what looked like a very fine piece of twine wrapped around the front of the dorsal fin. Over a series of days, we watched that wad of twine uh, get a little bit of algae on it and therefore increase drag. And literally that twine nearly severed the dorsal fin uh, in a matter of days. The animal did die, and when we recovered it, we also found that the flukes were involved and also nearly severed. Uh, this stuff is uh, sold under a number of brand names. Spider wire is one of them, but it's, it's a braided twine. This is what it looks like. We did some experiments and found that twine, uh, micro braided twine of the same strength as monofilament cuts much deeper into a fluke with similar forces applied. Uh, when we took a piece of monofilament that was the same diameter as the micrograded twine, it actually broke before it cut into the animal at all. Um, and this resulted in a publication that we put up. But this is some, some pretty nasty stuff and I think involves more than just bottlenose dolphins. Again, not seen in our area yet, but uh, certainly a concern of, with interactions are DFADs or drifting fish aggregating devices. Um, these are actually legal fishing devices, but they are not always recovered by the, by the fishers. And uh, they're becoming an increasing concern in the southeastern US. Uh, and they have been implicated in a number of entanglements with humpback whales, as well as sea turtles. So in summary, um, marine debris ingestion and entanglement is underreported. Uh, we certainly in Virginia see cases of serious injury and mortality with various types of debris. Fishing gear is problematic to assess as to whether it is derelict or not at the time of the interaction. Uh, but certainly interactions with actively fished gear, which would be called bycatch, can result in ghost gear, which would be derelict debris. Um, so this is, this is a, a source of derelict gear, I believe that people are not really thinking too much about. Uh, obviously I haven't addressed at all microplastics contempt 
chemical contamination or cumulative effects of, of all this on animals. Uh, and there are also many other animal groups affected by debris as, as many people know. So uh, I guess I'll... Uh, but I just want to acknowledge that these data have been collected by many, many people over, over the years. And uh, I'm certainly not the only one that's, that's done this. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Barco. And as an animal and wildlife lover, uh, these images are you know, kind of depressing to see, but really informative and really helpful for us to visualize and really better understand this issue. And I even see a comment by Amy Bloomfield in the chat that agrees and even made a note and interest in these images being used for education and reporting. Um, so just wanna thank you again for all the wonderful work you do um, to bringing light on this issue. Thanks. It is an- Go ahead. Thanks. Thanks, Sue. All right. So it is now my uh, pleasure to introduce Kate Fleming. Kate Fleming is Delaware's Sea Grants Coastal Ecology Specialist, where she works to understand and address a wide range of marine debris issues in her, in her state of Delaware. She also enjoys developing projects involving living resources and community science. Prior to her time at Delaware Sea Grant, Kate worked for the Delaware Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Control for nearly six years, first as a NOAA Coastal Management Fellow, followed by serving as the Division of Fish and Wildlife's Environmental Review Coordinator. Kate has a Master's in Science and Natural Resources from Delaware State University and a Master of Con uh, Conservation Biology from Victoria University of Wellington. Take it away, Kate. Thanks, Christy. I'm going to go ahead and uh, start my presentation and share my screen. Uh, let me screen share. Yes. All right, can everyone see my presentation? Looking good. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy, thank you for that introduction and I'm very happy today to be able to represent my team to share with you all um, what we're doing to learn uh, and understand and address uh, derelict crab pots in Delaware's inland bays where we have an exclusively recreational blue crab fishery. So before I jump into that, I just wanna quickly acknowledge my, uh, my co-leads on this project, which is funded by the NOAA Marine Debris Program. Uh, we have Dr. Art Trembinas, who's a University of Delaware professor, um, and Jen Rep, who uh, is a graduate student on this project that sits in arts lab. And so they're really kind of our mapping and sonar gurus. Art's a, a coastal geologist that specializes in habitat mapping in shallow coastal ecosystems. And then uh, Dr. Ed Hale, who is Delaware Sea Grants Fisheries Specialist, is also a co-lead on this project. And he leads a monitoring component to this project that I am not going to have time to talk about today, but I did want to make mention that he's on this project as well. Um, so a little background in Delaware, our blue crab fishery is a really big fishery. It's our most lucrative on the com commercial side, um, bringing in over 7 million uh, in landings alone um, each year. And then on the recreational side, we don't quantify the fishery in the same way, but it's a really popular pastime. And we know that it leads to uh, the, the capture of over a million blue crabs each year, oftentimes using this gear here that I have pictured that we're so concerned about in terms of ghost fishing, uh, the commercial style or Chesapeake style crab pot or crab trap. I tend to call them crab pots. Um, and the impacts that we experience in Delaware's inland bays um, are not unique. These are ubiquitous and we've heard a bit about these impacts already from the previous presentations. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our inland bays, though. Um, there are these three uh, bays that uh, are adjacent to our Atlantic Ocean in Delaware. They're really protected. They're very shallow, um, ranging their average depths are anywhere from two to eight feet, uh, depending on which bay we're talking about. And they're really, really uh, popular recreational areas. And so I think there's a lot of potential for potential uh, line strikes from passing boats to lead to lost uh, crab pots. And then also um, uh, because it's so shallow, navigation hazards are of particular concern in this area in addition to ghost fishing. And when I talk about derelict crab pots, I like to take the time to kind of differentiate between lost and abandoned pots where our abandoned pots I sometimes use as a proxy for 
um, talking about those pots that still have their lines and marker buoys connected to them. So presumably a crabber could return to it and retrieve it if they wanted to compared to our lost pots, which I kind of talk about those pots where the lines and marker buoys have been severed uh, so that these pots are lost beneath the surface of the water, or maybe uh, the, that pot buoy has been, um, been submerged even. And that's because in Delaware, anyways, we do address these pots a little bit differently where abandoned pots um, are actually an enforcement issue. So our natural resources police during the open season um, does have an active program to try and enforce their tending requirements in the recreational fishery. Um, and here in Delaware, uh, it's required to tend your pots at least once every three days. So if our uh, enforcement officers find that that hasn't taken place, they can, um, seize the pot and in that way, uh, they are hopefully discouraging some level of abandonment and then also removing abandoned pots from the environment. Compared to then lost pots, where presumably a crabber might wanna to return to it, but they can't find it because it's beneath the surface of the water. Certainly, even though our uh, waters are incredibly shallow in our inland bays, they're very turbid water, so it's difficult to see. And so the gold standard for finding these pots um, is to use side scan sonar. So this isn't new. This is something that many projects have used um, and we use the same kind of technology, this commercial grade uh, side scan sonar to look for uh, derelict crab pots. So our uh, current project, again, funded by the NOAA Marine Debris Program um, is staged in this, it's, I would call it the second uh, inland bay of our three inland bays, Indian River. And these bolded areas are the areas where we focus our work. Um, we did initiate this project in the middle of COVID-19, which was interesting, uh, but we were able to get some work done, so I'm excited to share that with you. Um, and we last year primarily focused our work in this area, this lower area of Indian River Bay. We did do some mapping in Indian River over here, but I'm going to be reporting on what we did over here in the southern part of Indian River Bay. Um, so our project always begins with comprehensive mapping. So as soon as the blue crab season closes up, um, Jen and Art, uh, the, the, their lab will go out and initiate comprehensive mapping of our study areas. So using that side scan sonar to collect acoustic imagery. And here's an example of how well the crab pots can pop in that acoustic imagery. Um, so that they can then take those data back into the lab, stitch it together, clean it up, and then go through it and identify all the uh, acoustic signatures that suggest there's a derelict crab pot present. So um, in their uh, uh, mapping in December of 2020, they documented almost 580 derelict crab pots in about 530 acres mapped, which is over one pot per acre. Um, and so this is pretty labor intensive work. And so John and Art have worked to develop an automated process uh, to help them identify these crab pots so that they don't have to go through and do it manually. Um, so they are, I know that this uh, is improved upon when they're able to collect more and more acoustic imagery data. They have lots from Delaware. So I just want to quick plug, um, if you happen to have sonar imagery with crab pot data, uh, they may be interested in receiving it to help improve this detector to work in different types of environments. And if you have questions about this, I have Art and Jen's uh, contact information on the slide here, and I'll have it up at the end of the presentation as well. They can use this information then to identify hot spots where these crab pots are aggregating. They can overlay that with um, data layers like bathymetry and sediment types uh, to help kind of start to look at some patterns associated with where these pots are um, congregating. And then it's also really helpful, this information, uh, to help inform game planning for actual removal efforts. And this is the part of the project that I lead um, is the actual removal of these crab pots. So, uh, we did host volunteer roundups in the middle of COVID-19. University of Delaware approved us to do this work. Um, and so we staged out of Holtz Landing State Park uh, here on the map. And I chose this site because for a number of reasons. It was ideal because the state park allows us to actually block one of the boat ramps um, in the wintertime and actually work in that boat ramp. Um, and I will say this is a finished boat ramp. This area Im imagery is old, um, but it's a completely finished boat ramp. There's lots of turnaround maneuverability, lots of 
a parking space for volunteers to come in with their boats. And then we also had access to a gated area uh, where we were able to keep a, a scrap metal dumpster, which kind of helped us just manage any kind of uh, avoiding any kind of public dumping that we wouldn't have been able to deal with since we were trying to recycle these pots, either reuse them for outreach and education or in living shorelines, or if they weren't reusable to at least scrap them as opposed to uh, throwing them away. So COVID-19 definitely influenced my approach. Um, we targeted nine dates during the closed blue crab season, so we're kind of limited to working in the winter time. Um, but the idea was that we would target nine dates to try and crew out all of those dates with the understanding that we were only going to go on the first three good weather days. So I was essentially identifying three days and then setting up two rain dates for each day. I hosted three virtual information sessions, uh, which was just a good opportunity for me to be able to talk to folks a little bit more about what we were looking for. In particular, because of COVID-19, we were really looking to recruit volunteers that had boats and could crew their own boats. I actually had to turn a lot of people away that wanted to help out but didn't have boats uh, because we wanted to keep our ground crew to an absolute minimum um, so that we could make sure that we were being super safe uh, while hosting this event in the middle of COVID-19. And then I hosted, um, I actually set up a, a registration form for these boat teams to sign up and then uh, required a training for all of them to attend so that we could go over logistics and uh, ensure they understood uh, what we were asking of them. So in the pandemic, I was able to recruit 31 volunteers um, and then also use 12 staff coming from mostly UD, but also uh, Delaware Fish and Wildlife sent a few staff to help us out as well. And that translated to seven volunteer boat teams and two staff boats. Um, and three of those boats, so the two staff boats and a volunteer boat were outfitted with side scan sonar technology. And then we had a few, again, minimum crew on the ground to receive pops. So the process was that even though we do all this pre-mapping, which is really helpful, we still need the, um, the site scan sonar to help us relocate the pots on the actual removal days. So we use that to figure out where to throw the grappling hooks um, and get our hooks on them so we can actually pull them up. And so what we did was to, in order to leverage the assistance of volunteers, um, our idea was to actually pull these pots up just enough out of the water to, to get a clip line and buoy on them and then set them back down. Um, and that way uh, we were able to work quickly through these pots and then leave that labor intensive work of getting the pots up over the gunnels and doing all the data and transporting to the volunteers that didn't have side scan sonar. I just want to quickly note that our crews were um, testing different types of sonar devices um, to see what were most effective in helping to relocate the pots. The side scan, of course, is always uh, pretty effective. We find that it works best when they're mounted to the front of the boats as opposed to the back. The Garmin Live Scope also worked really well from what I understand. I actually work on the ground, so I'm not talking from firsthand experience. Um, but again, our engine can answer any questions about these tech if you have any. And then the Humminbird 360 was another, um, another uh, uh, sonar that they attempted to use but had a little bit more trouble with. Uh, I think because that transducer functions by actually turning in a 360 rotation. Um, and so sometimes the boat would move before it finished the actual rotation. And so that was a little bit harder to understand where the pots were on the display screen compared to what was on the water. But the live scope and the side scans worked really well. Um, and then so again, our process was to have our volunteers picking up their equipment. They were issued grappling hooks and snips and clipboards and data sheets. Um, and then they were doing the heavy lifting of actually getting these pots up over the gunnels, which is a lot more effortful than just having to pull the pot up enough to put a clip line and buoy on it. Um, and we were having them record data and then transporting them to shore. And then once on shore, we had a, a, a small crew of no more than five that were removing the remaining sediment from these pots. Many of these pots were really sedimented in and very heavy. Um, and that again is important because we were trying to reuse and scrap these pots as opposed to just throwing them away. And so some key pieces of equipment for on the ground is a trash pump and trash hose to get those pots cleaned off properly. And then also a trailer to be able to transport the pots. Even though we had the scrap metal dumpster on site, uh, we still had to transport them from the boat ramp to where that uh, dumpster was staged. 
So best laid plans, right? So we had nine target dates, uh, planning to go three out of those dates. And then we had small craft advisories for I think seven and a half of those days. And in fact, I think eight and a half of those days. So we ended up being able to get out for a day and a half with our first day actually being a half day. Uh, it was the second to the last day in our target dates. Um, and so we had a little bit of attrition uh, because of that. We ended up going for a full day outside of our target dates. Um, and so ultimately we were able to remove 75 pots uh, despite the pandemic and despite weather. All of our pots we removed from White's Creek and we chose to work in this area given the kind of constraints with weather because we knew these were where our hotspots were. And so we were gonna be most efficient at working in that area. Um, we documented for this particular removal, live and dead blue crab and live and dead oyster toad fish, and then a number of species that were likely using the pots as habitat, juvenile species. Um, we do tend to see some different diversity of species when we collect pots in different areas or times of year uh, with associated projects. And I think that this information can be helpful just when we're trying to convey what our local fauna, what local fauna are being affected um, by the sterile fishing gear. And then something else I tried to document, uh, perhaps not su so successfully, was how many of these pots were still ghost fishing. Uh, when we piloted this project in uh, Rehoboth Bay to the north, this number uh, we documented it over 50%. In this particular area, um, we documented a minimum of 15% of these pots were still ghost fishing, but this I found was really difficult to track. I think because the pots are so filled with sediment, uh, they were kind of buckling under the weight of the sediment, and they were also being kind of pulled up twice. And so um, it was hard to track how many of these pots were being destroyed upon retrieval uh, compared to those that were already degraded from being out in the environment for a long period of time. And we did tell our volunteers that although we were trying to keep our pots intact if possible, um, not to hesitate to use their snips to cut them open, um, as we had to prioritize getting the pots on, on board and um, removed from the environment. So that was a tough one. Um, so that's how last year went. We have another year of mapping and removals coming up and, and monitoring, which again, I didn't get into that with Ed's support part of the project. Um, very much excited to expand our project this year. Hopefully all goes well with COVID. I've already heard from double the number of volunteers. Um, there was a lot of buzz from our efforts last year. And so um, if everyone comes out, I will have double the number of volunteer boat teams already, um, which means we need to increase our pot marking capacity. We were um, definitely limited in this area. We had a number of um, uh, agency partners that had wanted to send boats to help out that weren't able to get approval because of COVID. So we're hoping we can welcome them this year. And then I'll also just mention that Art and I are planning to host a workshop to actually train people uh, later this summer to use sites against owners for stewardship activities like helping us remove derelict crab pots. So if anyone's interested in that, we're prioritizing people that will be willing to come out and help us with our removal this winter. Um, and it's a free workshop. And I'm hoping to be able then to expand out um, uh, to land pots at more than one site. In particular, uh, there's a good spot up here that will be really strategic and will help us be a little bit more flexible with weather um, since we're not nearly as exposed to small craft advisories if we're able to work up in this part of Indian River. Uh, so I'll wrap it up there and I understand we will take questions at the end. Thank you, Kate. Um, I've had the opportunity to connect with Kate and the other Delaware partners on this project, and it has been amazing despite all the many hurdles of the past year and weather. Um, I especially enjoyed hearing about all the amazing new technologies you and the team are putting in place and just want to thank you again for all the work that you're doing for the recreational blue crab fishery and supporting inland bays. Uh, last but not least, uh, our next speaker is Sarah Aubrey, Business and Project Development Coordinator of Net Your Problems. Sarah, I'll invite you to put on your camera, which you already have. A um, little bit about Sarah. Uh, so working with Net Your Problems, Sarah has provided the opportunity to actively support and care for the ocean environment. In a world easily distracted by problems, Sarah was ecstatic to focus her energy and work ethic to support a company that is all about solutions. Problem solving for pro program success as unique as each geographical location. She's enjoyed interacting with a diverse array of stakeholders necessary to champion fishing gear recycling and support the world's 
move towards a circular economy. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining today. Um, if you want, more than uh, happy to share your slides right now. Perfect, thank you so much. How's that looking? I think we're almost up. Oh, we are good. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Yeah, no problem. Thank you. Um, first of all, thanks for all the other presenters. I really enjoyed your information. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I want to thank the Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Summit for inviting us. My name is Sarah Aubrey. I work for Net Your Problem. We recycle end-of-life fishing gear. And we specialize in marine debris prevention, ocean stewardship, and the circular economy. So today I'm going to tell you all about how Net Your Problem is working to make derelict fishing gear cleanups obsolete. So first off, I want you guys to imagine a world where people wear gold jewelry. I think you probably can. Uh, in this world, if a piece of jewelry breaks or it goes out of fashion, people throw it out. Sometimes it ends up in the garbage, sometimes it ends up in the back of a junk drawer, and sometimes it ends up tossed out a car window. I don't know how you'd feel, but if I saw this, first I'd be shocked and then I'd be really excited about the opportunity. Because in our world, this wouldn't happen. Gold is super valuable. Broken jewelry can be repaired and old jewelry could be melted down and turned into something new, just like fishing gear plastic. At the moment, here's what's going on with the waste management of fishing gear. Usually it ends up getting thrown away, which can take up a ton of space, create a lot of greenhouse gases and waste petroleum resources. If these waste is not properly managed, then it can end up causing damage to the marine environment. Cue not your problem. Dun, da, da, da. We work to turn fishing gear waste into something valuable in the trash to treasure model. Net Your Problem collects fishing gear waste and passes it on to our recycling partners to get it back into the plastic supply chain. We're in the business of marine debris prevention where we use ocean stewardship to create value out of a waste and add it in the first step in the circular economy to turn it into something new. If we can manage our waste properly, then it doesn't have a chance to become marine debris. How do we do it? Well, we start out finding something like this, a big pile of old fishing gear, just hanging around. Uh, we talk to local fishermen, the dump, look into storage yards, and we get organized. We identify key st stakeholders in the community. Here is our founder, Nicole Baker. She's in Alaska working with some fishermen in their gear storage yard. And connecting with these fishermen is really our specialty. After we collect the gear, we separate the different types of plastics and make these cute little bundles. Just like the progressive lady, we love our little bundles. Here I am working in San Diego, uh, removing different types of line from gilt, drift gill nets. And this bikini top I'm wearing there is made out of old fishing nets. While all this organizing and prep is going on, we get the transportation logistics figured out and get all the necessary documents and paperwork done. Everything we need for sending this gear to its new life whether it's to be reused. We work with a ton of artists. Here is our team member, Erin. She's at the Rope Depot where she collects and sells old lobster line to artists. And we like to work as top, as near to the top of the waste hierarchy pyramid there. So 
reduce is is the best thing that we could do with waste and reuse is the next best thing and after that is recycling and if we can't reuse it we send it to our recycling partners where it gets turned into these little pellets it gets washed and shredded extruded and these pellets can either be used for injection molding or spun into yarn to make clothing we make fishermen the heroes in this story of fishing gear plastic and then everybody wins we need their support and participation to make this whole thing work now I know a lot of you might be cringing right about now. A big part of the plastic waste conversation is focused on microplastics and reducing production. And that work is really, really important. But over the last couple of years, I've learned a valuable lesson about how to make traction and achieve tangible, concrete results. We must understand that totally eliminating plastic from our lives is not possible and maybe not even desirable. There are benefits to using plastic and we must meet the world where it is. We should be striving to reduce and then manage our waste properly. By aiming for this type of milestone, we'll be able to make real practical and measurable improvements, steering things in the direction of the world the way we want it to be. Manufacturers are making things from plastic, which we know will eventually turn into waste. And if landfilled, never goes away. If we keep this plastic in the supply chain, where there actually currently is a lack of supply, can you imagine that, a lack of, of plastic? Uh, we can reduce the need for oil to be extracted and extruded into virgin plastic. This reduces the overall environmental impacts of manufacturing while at the same time reduces the amount of waste in the environment. And the best part, we can do this right now while solutions to microplastics and alternatives to plastic materials are still developing. Now I'm gonna to talk to you about some of the key elements to our program success. Uh, this includes capturing what we do so we can tell a great story both to the brands using our recycled gear and the consumers buying the products made of post recycled content. And it also helps provide incentive for fishermen and coastal communities to participate. We are continually increasing our network to streamline logistics, take advantage of ways our partners can help make our programs more cost effective and essentially build in more participation. We use best practices to make sure that we can offer a high quality product to our recycling partners and are even starting the conversation to get fishing gear recycling into different sustainability certifications. Moving into the future, here's what we're currently working on to improve and expand. The first thing when we go to a new area is we have to find these coalitions, a variety of stakeholders who are interested in the ocean economy and help us distribute costs. The second thing we're working on is improved traceability. Not only do we tell a good story, but we can document and verify our services to avoid greenwashing. And with the current digital twin and blockchain technology, this is really helping to follow our material from collection to the product marketplace, which is a really exciting. Uh, the third thing that we work on is brand partnership, so helping them tell the story of what we do and where they get their materials from and drive demand for our products and services. Uh, we're taking climate action, supporting our partners in the transportation sector to reduce emissions and always working to maximize our shipping efficiency. We've got some 
work with domestic recyclers to increase the capacity of our domestic recycling capabilities, which is super exciting. And lastly, we're working on entering the product marketplace with some NYP products. There are some types of plastic that can't be easily mechanically recycled, so we also are engaging in some pretty cool R&D for these types of plastic fishing gear. So here we are working to bring this happy ending to all the largest fishing ports in the US. We started with programs in Alaska and to date have been able to collect and recycle 971,000 pounds of plastic, which is pretty exciting. Now that we've got that down, we're focusing more onto the continental US including the mid-Atlantic. There's some huge fisheries landing ports in Reedville and the Hampton Roads area of Virginia. So we were really excited for the opportunity to speak with you and get engaged with this region today. So here's my question. After hearing this presentation, where do you fit in this puzzle of making waste fishing gear so valuable we won't ever have to clean it up again? Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to connecting with you and yeah, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you, Sarah. It was really great to hear about Net Your Problems innovative approach to address end of life fishing gear and you're um, collaborating with fishermen and different types of industries. So thank you again. Um, and I want to thank again to all of our speakers today. Um, it was really exciting and educational presentations. And I'll now ask, um, for all the speakers, if you want to turn on your camera um, at this time for the Q&A portion of today. So we're going to try to keep this as conversational as possible. So um, really welcome panelists to build off each other's ideas. Um, again, reminder at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a Q&A chat. Um, please feel free to use that. We'll be getting to those questions today. And if there's any particular question for one of the speakers, please make sure to put their names in that. Um, so with that, I'm going to first start with some questions pulled from the registration form. Um, and so with that, uh, first question, biggest, what, what's the biggest challenge that you face in your work, uh, to address recovered or derelict fishing gear? So anyone feel free to jump in as far as the biggest challenges you face. I think locally, this is Sue, um, getting people to understand that it is actually a problem. Very well said, Sue. Certainly the awareness and attention on this issue. Any other thoughts here? I know in terms of thinking about our project, which is specific to removal as opposed to prevention, um, just I feel like building that sonar expertise is is a really key uh, for our process um, is a really key uh, piece of being able to expand out and um, get bigger. We've got lots of people that want to help and then only a subset of those people have boats and then <laughs> only a subset of those people actually have sonar and then only a subset of those people know how to use it. So we'll always be limited to our own expertise if we want to grow this out and kind of create a self-sustaining process, we need to build that, that capacity. I might build off of that and jump in and say that because the Triple GI tries to be kind of this network of knowledge sharing and information lessons learned, um, we work really hard to, to support these folks, but ultimately the, the people on the ground, there's no there's no silver bullet to it. And that's what makes it hard. Like every case is so different, the local context, the types of gear, the fish, you know, rules and regulations for each fishery. And so, you know, when we try to connect partners or we try to have these types of projects, it's about getting up to speed and learning what our, our local partners do and redoing that every time we start work in a new region. And so um, that's kind of ours, but um, Kate would love, love to hear about how we can maybe think about building some of that capacity and knowledge sharing. Oh, maybe we should chat. Look at this, collaborating already. <laughs> um, <laughs> any other thoughts as far as the biggest challenges you face or your organization has faced? 
Yeah, I guess I'll just say, I think one of our biggest challenges figuring out who is or should be or can be responsible for making it happen. Uh, I think a lot of uh, it's hard when it's, you know, an ocean problem and everybody's coastal problem to really pinpoint who's gonna gonna take the action and and make the financial contribution to to get it done. Thanks, Sarah. Actually, that brings me to another of our uh, pre-registration questions. If you had unlimited funding, where would you put your money to solve this issue? Opening up to all panelists. While you're thinking, I can speak for the Marine Debris Program or myself. If we were able to get more funding, I think we would love to be able to just continue to fund um, through our grant competitions for prevention, for community-based removal and research on this issue. Yeah, I would definitely put a lot of it into technological advances, especially for dealing with derelict gear. You know, the problems of biofouling bio and stuff make it really difficult to recycle. And it'd be nice to have a non-landfill option for that type. It is so effortful to have to remove uh, this gear that it does seem like we'd have better bang for our buck um, working towards prevention. I just find prevention so difficult. <laughs> You know, I think a lot of people, so often when I give these presentations, um, I've learned over time that I want to take time to talk about um, the abandonment and what people do, uh, what our enforcement officers do uh, to address abandoned pots in our state, because so often the comments I receive when I don't talk about that issue is, well, how can we improve enforcement and there should be rules and um I think it's helpful to share what's already being done. And I think enforcing an existing regulation is only going to get you so far. So many, so much of this gear is unintentionally lost. Um, and so when it's unintentionally lost, what can you do to prevent that from happening? Um, that becomes really, really difficult. It's, you know, trying to share ideas for how you can crab more responsibly or trying to talk to voters to try to slow down, but the truth is it's an accident. Um, and gee, Susan, I didn't even think about interactions with wildlife potentially um, creating, creating derelict gear. So that's a whole other uh, thing to think about. Um, but yeah, when it's an accident, I think it's really hard, <laughs> but it's important if we could crack that nut, I think that's, uh, so much more efficient than, than removal. Thanks, Kate. And Sue, I think, oh, we have you back. Your, your uh, screen froze for a hot second, but uh, do you want to build off of that, Sue? Sure. I mean, I, I think that, that bycatch in general with, with protected marine species is accidental. No, no fisherman wants to catch a sea turtle or a dolphin. Um, I would, I would, I still want to understand much more about how, why, when, and where these animals interact with the gear, whether the gear was in fact derelict when they interacted with it, and if and how many animals interact with gear and then um, and then shed the gear and where the head gear goes. Um, there, there's there's an awful lot. I think the problem is much larger in our area than, than we have been able to document for many, many reasons. And we've been working a lot with, with local peers and peer fishermen and, and uh, animals, uh, sea turtles primarily that are caught on hook and line. And you know everything requires reporting and not everybody can even read the signs which are mostly in English. And, and so um, you know, getting a much better idea of what's going on, we haven't even touched working with the recreational fishing community from boats. We, we've really focused on piers alone because they are the densest areas where we can, we can get our messages out to folks the easiest, but there are head boats and there are personal boats and there are charter boats. And there are a lot of people using hook and line gear. Oh, I think we lost you again, Sue. So we might have to have you um... Turn off your camera and just hear your voice. 
I don't know what's going on with my internet. Uh, you know, I know we're getting uh, some storms over here, so I'm just assuming yeah. it might be tied to that. But um, yeah, so we just got the, lost the tail end of that. <laughs> we There's just so much we don't know about animal gear interactions. And, and there's so much more to know and understand. And so that's that's where my focus would be if I had, if someone handed me a blank check. Just kind of a fantasy. It's fun to think about, yes, Jackie. <laughs> I would, I would even go almost bigger, like take what Susan said and, and think bigger, and and animal interactions and things um, is part of it. But we don't have a good sense of the scale of this problem globally. That that six hundred and forty thousand metric ton figure that I mentioned is based on a paper from the seventies, and so global gear loss estimates are, you know, there, there's a lot of efforts happening right now, but it it's hard work to talk to all of the different fishers around the world and all of the different type of, types of fisheries and say, how often do you, you know, lose your gear and why do you lose your gear and how do you, where do you lose your gear? Um, and so really getting an understanding of that, whether in the mid-Atlantic context or a U.S. context or, you know, globally, I think too would help us to understand the scale and scope of the problem and then create the solutions that are going to have the biggest impact. Thanks, Jackie. Um, I'm going to change gears, pun intended, um, and focus on a question from one of our Q&A polls directed at Sue um, from Shana Sade. Uh, so when observing entangled animals for days at a time, it seems that in several cases, the animals ultimately die. For instance, the dolphin with a thin wire that got algae on it and cut into the, cut into the fin. In these cases where they're being watched for prolonged periods of time, what is the decision-making process for when and if to intervene and to try to aid the animal versus just observing? Um, I think that was directed at Sue, but all panelists are welcome to respond as well. Sure, um, it, it, is, it is a complex process um, guided by the fact that we are permitted to do what we do through the National Marine Fishery Service for marine mammals and both the Oh, Sue, we're not having a lucky technology day. I am so sorry. <laughs> well, with that, Sue, I think I heard you come back in a second. Um, perhaps but you can, could also add your response into the chat box feature with um, all panelists and all attendees as well. Hopefully we'll figure out that tech issue. Um, all right, so this one is open up to, uh, this is from our pre-registration uh, questions and opening up to everyone it was a question tied to policies. So what policies exist in your state to reduce or remove derelict fishing gear? If there are no policies in place, what do you wish decision makers and legislators would put in place? So this could be on a state level, national, international, we can dream big here. Um, so opening that up to, uh, up to all the panelists. I do think it would be helpful to be able to remove gear during the open season. Um, right now we're working in the closed season. Um, and I do think that there could be changes that are made to the way that our blue crab fishery uh, is implemented, I guess, um, that could be more effective in minimizing um, derelict crab pots um, that get away from just this. So, so oftentimes the suggestion I hear is, well, can't we mark the pots with contact information? And um, I, I, based on what I know of how their existing regulation is implemented, I don't think that that would be so effective. Um, we already have the pot buoys have to be marked with a name and address, um, but you know, I. I think marking the actual crab pot with, with contact information, you're still leaning on enforcement to enforce a tending requirement as opposed to maybe setting up different ways that the fishery could be implemented to minimize um, the potential for derelict fishing gear. Thanks, Kate. Any other thoughts in this dream world where we have a uh, agency to create policies
I have like a very specific answer that's actually related to one of the other questions that came through. And um, there's another question kind of in the queue about it being illegal to remove uh, pots except during a small window in winter. Um, and the, the example is in North Carolina, but it, rules like that are common kind of all over the world. And they're usually there so that fishers don't interact with each other's gear, right? Like, you know, oh, I want to fish in this spot or, you know, something like that. And so they're not, those those regulations aren't created with, with the knowledge of uh, ghost gear in mind. And so some of the workarounds we've seen is that there are uh, places where they introduce permits, where it's okay, you know, like they said, in certain windows or certain organizations who are doing more regular monitoring can go and do that. And so um, since the US does a lot of its fisheries regulation by state, it takes a little bit longer in order uniform thing across the board, but there are ways of, you know, rethinking these policies that were created with really good intention and kind of updating them to meet what we now know is going on. Thanks, Jackie. That actually reminded me, I have sometimes thought like even, even I understand, I know, okay, so I understand why uh, we're limited to working during the close season. It does make sense. I know that there are models, for example, the state of Louisiana, I think their season is open year round. And so they'll have sections of their fishery that closes down to remove pots throughout the year. And that's kind of cool. Um, so that's a model that could be applied to other areas. I also think if we are gonna be limited to working during the close season, currently um, I've been permitted to remove pots. And so I always have to be present when, um, when we stage a removal event, as opposed to just anyone could go out on any day during the close season to remove a pot. And so maybe with some training that we provide, perhaps the state could allow for a, a, long, a longer time period um, where I don't personally necessarily have to be present or have specific individuals present um, so that that could perhaps incorporate a little bit more flexibility. And I realize those aren't policies so much as regulations, but they're all, you know, there are nuances to the way things could be structured, I think, to uh, help, help just build capacity for people that are interested to want to and want to respond be able to do so. Yeah, it's certainly very intertwined, especially with like regulations, enforcement and whatnot. So, so thank you for that. So another question we received uh, was, is there, as a, regarding public awareness, I know uh, Sue hit on this when we first started, it was just like having folks aware of this issue, but is there anything in particular that you wish the general public really knew about derelict fishing gear or ghost fishing um, that you'd like to build off of? And Sue, I, we can try to get you back, but <laughs> uh, yes, Sarah. Yeah, sorry. Um, I think um, the points that you guys brought up about, about how their accidents you know, and how much of a, of a benefit it would be to have the community doing what they can and, and supporting these prevention and cleanup efforts, I think is probably really important so that, you know, we move away from blaming and, and towards some actual actions. Thank you, Sarah. Any others? We may have lost Jackie in the process due to some tech issues. Um, hoping she can get back on. Well, another question in the meantime was tied to innovative approaches. So uh, I think all of you actually hit on this or different aspects of this, but what are the new innovations, emerging technologies or software that you are most excited about to address this issue? Um, I know you highlighted a lot of these in your presentation, but perhaps you can expand on it just a little bit more for our, uh, the folks on our call. Well, 
Well, I think the detector work that Art and Matt are work or um, Art and Jen are working on or um, is pretty exciting. I think that has applications for beyond just our region. Um, and could be helpful um, for groups that are looking to uh, understand and inform um, removal activities across the US. Um, so that's pretty exciting. Yeah, I, there, there's a lot of innovation happening right now with material flow and using using different materials in really out of the box ways. And I find that really exciting. Um, there's, there's so many better ways that we can be doing something. And I think it's really important to focus on those technological advances so that we see that just as many problems we have, we have that many opportunities. Thanks, Sarah. And Sue? I'll try. Can you hear me? OK, um, I think some of the ropeless gear technology is um, is really interesting. And I'm hoping that that will move from something that's that's only accessible to commercial fishermen that are using pot trawls to you know recreational folks or folks that are using single pots. Because I think vertical lines are a huge issue for animals and um, and it's loss of vertical lines that also results in uh, actively fish gear be becoming derelict gear. So if we can find better ways to fish without vertical So we lost you again, but I think we caught most of that. So thank you for, for adding in that input. Uh, and Jackie, welcome back. Well, this is a fun technology afternoon. Um, right now we're discussing just innovations in place. And so what uh, the question was posed of what new innovations, emerging technologies or software are you most excited about to address the derelict fishing gear issue? And that could be anything you discussed or anything you wish existed. Yes, um, apologies, my my computer, I think, overheated and just completely shut down. So, but I'm glad I was able to get back on. Um, I think in terms of things that I'm excited about, I'm gonna give one maybe like cop out shameless plug answer and one just from our work, but I really am excited about our, our new Triple GI data portal. Um, the one that existed previously was meant to be our proof of concept and um, really see like, is there an appetite for a place to house this type of information? And so we had lots of great entries from um, our members sharing that information. Um, and now that we've done that, we've really worked to kind of build out our you know, data sharing agreements and making sure that that's information that can be shared. Um, and I think that these new reporting tools are gonna be really great for a lot of our members who wanna start tracking this you know, across the long term or a larger scale. And then I will also say too that a number of our members are technology firms who are trialing things like smart buoys or um, things that attach to the side of kind of crab pots or lobster pots that pop up to the surface. So if that is lost, it's timed based on how long that pot is submerged and it will come to the surface and it's marked and it can be seen. So just a lot of really neat innovation and seeing how those can be applied in different contexts has been really great. Thanks, Jackie. No shameless plugs here. Um, so appreciate that. And I did get a note from Sue, who had one additional thing she wanted to mention, that we need to innovate and legislate more on gear marking so we can better track the origin of gear, both commercial and recreation. So thank you all for that. I now want to go to a, a question posed in our Q&A from Sandy Smith, and this is directed at you, Kate. So Kate, in regards to the side sonars, do you provide any for volunteers or is it tasked to UDEL? Uh, she mentions that we have folks with boats, uh, but like you, they do not have sides, side scan sonars. Um, so it seems like you can't just put one temporarily on a boat. So if you mind expanding on that. Yeah, so we have a number of sonar units and multiple boats. Um, so we do have a small fleet that we um, that we are able to use for the for the crab pot roundups. It's just as we're expanding out, we're going to need more boats. Um, and 
we don't have at UD, we don't have extra sonars to give out. Um, one of our partners at Delaware Coastal Programs, I know has some extra sonars and it's unclear to me if they have any that could be available. But if I, you know, if we had a partner, like an agency that was interested in, um, in helping out as opposed to trying to put it on, you know, a, a, someone from the public, I feel like I would at least ask the question. I don't, I, I'm still a little unclear if they have sonars available or if they've been designated for other projects, but um, you can mount them and um, they don't have to be permanently mounted onto, onto the boats either. Um, I know sometimes, oh, this is not my area, but sometimes they're able to do a temporary rig. But you do have to know how to use them. There needs to be some training, you know, um, you can't just slap a sonar on someone's boat and expect them to be able to effectively go out and use, although I do think they're relatively user-friendly, the consumer grade uh, sonars that we use, um, uh, you know, it, takes, it would take a little bit of training before you, before you could expect someone to go out and use that to inform where you're going to throw a grapple and then hook a crab pot. Certainly a lot of aspects just to, to get those volunteer efforts going. So thank you again, Kate, for all your great work. Uh, only a few more questions left. Uh, the next one is regarding stakeholders. So what are the target stakeholders you work with and how do you go about uh, messaging uh, to work with them and address the issue? And so I know we've hit on this a number of times, but perhaps you can expand on that a little bit and um, any lessons learned you have with that as well. My project is fairly narrow focused, I think, compared to some of the other presenters um, in that we're working in a recreational blue crab fishery in Delaware. So we are trying to reach out to recreational crabbers, but really any anyone um, that's concerned about stewardship of our inland bays. And so our stakeholders are recreators, they're, um, uh, you know, nonprofits and partners. Um, we did a lot of uh, uh, posting flyers at some of our local facilities like uh, boat ramps and um, some of our marinas. I think we could do a better job of that. Um, we have some local folks that have a big kind of reach in our recreational communities. So some of our fishing clubs and um, uh, web-based presence uh, that we've been able to get the word out to. Um, but again, I recognize that our project is uh, more narrow focused than some of the other folks that are speaking today. Sarah, yeah. Yeah, well, it's really fun because really a lot of people that you wouldn't expect, you know, there's a lot of unlikely partners that have things to offer. For example, we had a brewery offer to give us a big lot in the back to help us process gear so we wouldn't have to rent a space. Or, you know, we have artists that take it and, and need it all over the place. They want to put it on their piano or put something, a sculpture up in their town. And we work with a lot of waste management um, for equipment. You know, there's um, fish processors that donate some forklift time or, you know, there's all these little moving parts. And there are a lot of people who are interested and passionate about what we're doing and it's it's fun that you you never know where someone might have some some type of of uh, something to offer so it's kind of exciting thanks sarah it sounds like you uh collaborate with a lot of fun and, and interesting partners and i know jackie had to go uh off video for the moment due to technical difficulties. But Jackie, uh, if you want to answer that question as far as the different type of stakeholders you engage with. Okay, so not hearing anything. Uh, we have one final question. Um, that is also a plug for tomorrow. So on day three of a summit, our final session will be 
success stories of what can you do. And so opening this up to everyone, whether it's derelict fishing gear or marine debris, is there anything that gives you hope on the work that you're doing um, that inspires you that you want to share today? I try not to speak first every time. Um, I was so impressed by the enthusiasm of some of these folks that came out. I, our fleet was a little small last year, I think because of COVID-19, but I was, I mean, seven boats in the middle of a pandemic. I was really happy with that. And we had really dedicated volunteers um, that wanted to go out and were willing to stick with us despite the weather. And like I said, I've already heard from double that number of people this year, just from the buzz of last year without doing any additional recruiting. And so there's a lot of enthusiasm, um, for wanting to be part of the solution, um, that I believe we can harness and is just very uplifting and exciting. Um, and it was really fun to be out on the water, with these people in the middle of winter and they were having the best time. I mean, it just like it's, it, they were having a great, they're laughing the whole time, having a great time. So that's very uplifting. Yeah, I've just been really excited to see how many brands are taking a big step into incorporating recycled plastics into their products and really creating this pathway where people are, are gonna be even more motivated to take care that their stuff isn't getting lost or uh, this idea that there's a whole new life to the products that we're using and kind of moving away from this throwaway culture. It's, it's, it's pretty exciting to see. Yeah, it's definitely um, very exciting times. And uh, I got a note from Susan who uh, shared for, for them, it's the animal success stories, like the loggerhead they removed uh, hooks from in 2015 that was recently captured and tagged by colleagues in June, 2021. It has grown 40 uh, centimeters and doubled in weight. So it's actually kind of seeing, seeing the great work that you're doing. And so with that, um, and I just want to thank you all. That was our final question. Um, really want to thank you and the speakers for your insightful feedback um, and thank everyone for joining us today, especially with the patients uh, and understanding with technology. Um, we certainly have learned a lot of these different aspects of addressing the is issue. Um, and I just, again, want to thank all of you. Oh, there's Susan again. Thank you, Susan, um, for uh, this really exciting discussion and for being here uh, today with the second day of the summit. Um, so with that, um, feel free to turn off your cameras. And it was really great to uh, see you all. Um, we do have uh, one final poll today that we should see, um, if you don't mind popping that up, AV team. Um, with the poll is, what solutions should we focus on in the Mid-Atlantic to address derelict fishing gear with options for removal, prevention and awareness, new technologies and devices, collaboration across sectors, and all of the above? So I'll give everyone a moment to um, answer that. Um, this information isn't only interesting for purposes of today's session, uh, but also really helpful for us to better understand regional interests um, and our regional needs. And so let's see, do we have the results up yet? Can we pull those up for me? All right, an astounding all of the above. That is really great to see. So we certainly have a, a lot of work to do. And again, this information and, and you know, your responses here will be saved um, for benefit of not only for the Mid-Atlantic Marine Debris Working Group, the summit planning team, but also helpful for the Marine Debris Program to see where your interests are. So with that, if we want to move to the next slide, I just want to uh, thank you all again for your really great questions. Thank you to the speakers for taking the time today. We truly could not do this without you. Uh, so as I wrap up, I would just like to, again, share to join us tomorrow, Thursday, July 22nd at 12.30 p.m. to learn about single-use plastics and hear from experts on what we can do to solve the problem. Um, we'll continue to have um, 
polls and breakout sessions uh, tomorrow. So really encouraging um, participation from the group. And uh, I just want to thank you all again for the opportunity. I certainly learned a lot today and I had a blast doing it. And so I hope all of you have a really lovely rest of the day. And thank you again for joining us. And with that, have a great night.